on uh, Facebook as well. And here we go. Here we go. So, right. Thank you very much to the 20 people that I see already connected on uh, Instagram and the ones that are coming from Facebook. We normally do a super duper presentation of our, our guest. Uh, this time again, we are experimenting this way of being online, not only on Facebook, but only on Instagram. Uh, who are we? What do we do? Uh, you're familiar with the limited edition. We nurture the love for independent watchmaking. We try to give our humble contribution in, uh, um, in um, uh, I want to say, educating uh, the market about the value of independent watchmaking, introducing always new uh, 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 amazing creative independent watch brands. But today we, are, we have one of the guests that uh, we really looked forward to have on board from H. Moser, one of the most established independent watchmakers in the market is, of course, you would have guessed, is Edouard Melin on, uh, on the other side of the screen. Hi, Edouard. Hi, Pietro. How are you? Very well, thank you. Thanks for making the, the time to have this chat with us. Um, let's crack on, if you, uh, if you agree. Um, by what I was saying in my introduction, we, uh, we have a big thing for sharing what value is in watchmaking, and especially for getting uh, our audience to fully evaluate and fully appreciate the value that is behind independent watchmaking. So the first question is a very, very um, uh, specific one. What is for Edouard Melin value in watchmaking? Well, independent watchmaking, uh, well, I, you know, I, I, I grew up in the, the watchmaking industry, so tradition is extremely important to me. Um, what I like about being independent is the freedom it gives us. Uh, you know, we are entrepreneurs. Uh, we are a lot of young people, family business, and which gives us the possibility to do a lot of things that, that we like on the product side, but also on the communication side. And I think something that uh, we really value at H. Moser is just to be uh, ourselves, express ourselves. Um, of course, at the end of the day, we want to, to, to sell watches, but uh, a lot of the things we do is just with, uh, with we're doing the things what we believe in, um, even if some people don't like it. Um, it's really this value of, of having the freedom of doing whatever we want, taking some risks sometimes and uh, doing beautiful things, hopefully for our customers. Absolutely. So, uh, of course we, uh, we have lived some, um, I want to say some drama, but you know, from our side, it was all excitement about <laughs> some of the campaigns that you've run recently, some of the teasing products that you've, you've launched. Uh, and some of the legends that you've created across, you know, the last uh, three to four years. I'm thinking about the Swiss Alp uh, watch. I'm, I'm thinking about the uh, Swiss Mad uh, watch. I'm thinking about the Swiss icons. Um, what does it take to stay uh, faithful to those principles you were talking about? Uh, so being independent, uh, um, what does it take in terms of not just do it once, but carry on? being always creative, always daring, always edgy in the approach? Well, in a way, it's, I think it's a, it's a philosophy, you know, you, um, of course, being outspoken and, and provocative um, has a very fun and exciting side, but it's also a very uh, scary and, and risky side, as we've uh, seen on some of the, um, the should I say, stunts that, uh, that, that we did. But at the end of the day, it's about, as I said, a philosophy, working with people who have that mindset, who believe in what, in what we do, who stand behind it, who, who trust, um, uh, who trust, I would say, the, the vision of, uh, of our family, of our team, of myself, and, and then try to, uh, to nurture this, uh, this creative spirit. And uh, I have the chance to have uh, amazing people working with me here in, uh, in Neuhausen am Rheinfall. Um, and also around the world because we have a great team in Hong Kong. Uh, now we're establishing a team in, uh, in uh, Dubai with my brother. I think it's kind of having those people working together. We try to make workshops uh, together. We try to, to have people involved to really own those ideas. I think that's really what, what helps us be, being always on, um, on the creative side, have an open mindset. Um, what I tell my team is I don't want people to, to to come up with ideas when I ask them to, to, to bring ideas. We should be constantly open to, to our environment to get the next uh, idea. 
and uh, that has worked really well in, in the past and we will continue to do that. I, I have a beautiful board here in my office with tons of post-its of ideas that came from, uh, from, uh, from those people and we're trying to take one by one those ideas down uh, as we establish them, implement them in our, uh, in, our, in our communication or product development or whatever strategy. So you keep the creative vein and the support that every single person within the company can can bring as a as a source of inspiration in a way. Yeah, most of them. Those who are willing to to contribute, to, uh, and some love it, some don't, and we don't force anyone. I think uh, also externally, uh, we don't work much with agencies because you know we need to move fast. We need um, the brands evolves very quickly, and we realized we try to to work with uh, with agencies. Unfortunately, they it's they, they don't um, should I say follow the, the 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 pace because as they work on an idea we have we're already on the next one so uh, so it's really trying to nurture this uh, this spirit internally having the right people who can really grow with the brand absolutely absolutely yeah very very interesting uh, insights and um I want to I want to say and I want to ask because a, a little bit you know in a very humble way but we feel like we represent a little bit some of the in the uh, in the um, brands collectors, uh, from the point of view, so from the other side, you've given us some insights. If you put yourself from the other side, so like if you were a watch collector, uh, honestly, what would you say today um, is the main difference when you approach, you approach yourself for your own watch collection between a mainstream brand and an independent brand? And I just add one little thing. I just had a case today. Uh, of one of our, one of our watch uh, watch collectors was hesitating between a very established, very respectful, amazing timepiece uh, that is though produced in, in in very high numbers and is um, is a watch that more or less has been looking the same for the last thirty years without wanting to ma mention the watch. Uh, and on the other side, it was on a completely, totally different timepiece, and it happened to be that the prices are very very close to each other. So the collector was hands on his heart was asking me how how do i compare the two things how do i compare legacy tradition establishment to funk you know the funky creative side to the other timepiece that is in my hands so for edouard melin what is the one single difference you would single out between mainstream and indie watchmakers when you have to find value I think there's many aspects. At the end of the day, it's it's really. Uh, I mean, when you spend so much money on a on a on a watch, what I mean for everybody, it's a lot of money. And I think it's, at the end of the day, it's really it's really a, an emotional uh, decision. It really comes uh, from the the heart. For for me, today, I think a big element of of which would contribute uh, for me to take such a decision is the connection I have to the brand. And that's why on our side, we value it so much. I think today marketing ma makes a lot of, of, uh, of, of, uh, of the visibility of, uh, of the big brand. But I think one thing that makes the difference between um, uh, independent brands and the big established traditional brands is the human dimension. And I think being able to, to, to connect to the people being the watchmaker, being the owner, being even the salesperson in the market that is really behind that brand with his soul and heart, uh, which, which will you know come to your home, deliver you a, a, a strap um, on a Sunday afternoon. This is what for me is, is is important. At the end of the day, you know I buy something for 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 the long term that I like that I want to 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 keep. That every time I will look at it or hold it in my hand will bring me that same emotion and. Um, and that emotion beyond the product comes from the from the people behind it. And uh, if you say the two products are very similar, then I would I would go into, as I said, the human dimension, which is so important to us. Yeah, yeah, um, no, very interesting. I am um, sorry, Edouard. I take the opportunity to thank all of those that have been uh, connecting so far, uh, especially on uh, Instagram, but also on uh, on Facebook. Uh, just let us know if there is any audio or visual issue whatsoever let us know the beauty of this platform is that we can stop and restart whenever whenever we want uh and um it's funny because yeah. i see a lot of the, those amazing guys that we meet you know in uh, in uh, singapore hong kong the middle east yeah. the us yeah. giving their yeah. comments there so <laughs> yeah some uh, some they, they 
but it's the idea of having a community of, of kind of friends at the end of the day you know if, if in a business like ours you cannot build those kind of relationships then what what kind of a business uh, do you want to work in and, and we have the, the, the great chance in in our business to to meet all over the world amazing people and Absolutely. over the last few years I have people that that you know are becoming more and more friends as we meet and you know sometimes we just meet for a drink or sometimes a cigar some of those guys yeah because to some extent i don't know if you agree but it, i mean to convey passion which is otherwise an empty word you need proximity you need to you know to create stories with the people that then enjoy you know what you do um, this uh, what i see every day uh, with our collectors um, yeah, i mean this community is the biggest i mean the the, the, the I would say fans, but people that appreciate and understand what we do is for me the is is amazing. I remember four years ago, five years ago, when we launched our first campaign, and you know you get attacked. I mean, when you try to provoke, you have a lot of people who have something negative to say about it, of course. But we we knew it. But in the beginning, you take it quite personal. And today, there's so many people who <laughs> who take kind of own the idea, even though they they they're not within within Moser. Uh, and take the, the the freedom to answer uh, and and in the right words sometimes better words than ours and also more objective since you know obviously we're not very objective um, with our own baby but uh, that's that's probably the for me the the biggest result beyond the fact that you know we're selling watches at, and, and more watches a year over year the fact that we have people who really aren't understand uh, what we're trying to do, even though five years ago we had no clue what we were trying to do with Moser, is for, for me the biggest result. Yeah, and I can see that very well if you let me, because even uh, with our little, very tiny and very humble project of the limited edition, we had uh, uh, a lot of that. We, we see that this, the, the, community, uh, the community can be created and is very instrumental to the success of the brands and, and what we do, because independent watchmaking is about taking part and nurturing a passion. Uh, otherwise, you'll be just, you know, just buying another watch from any shelf, from any uh, stockists in the world. So, uh, yeah. On the other, on the other side, Edouard, very good question, I think, for you. Besides uh, the values uh, behind being independent, being able to make your own decisions without having to go, on a, you know, every couple of weeks to a massive board of directors in another country to just get all of your ideas approved, and that's value because you can express your pre creativity. Um, I kick my butt sometimes. <laughs> so, another big point is, of course, about producing yourself your ideas and making them real by yourself you have taken the very concept of producing in-house to the extreme uh, even me personally i've been involved to some uh, uh, um, integrated manufacturers uh, in, in my in my old days in the watch industry i have had the pleasure of visiting your premises with one of our collectors recently and i have to say it was uh, it was an experience that um uh, yeah so the question comes naturally why are you pushing so much in the in-house concept? What is that element bringing to you? And how do you see it uh, projected in the future uh, strategically for Moza? I think there's two aspects. This first one is, is going back to the idea of, of tradition. Um, I love the idea of you know, we produce products. It's not just drawing. We actually make the parts, we assemble them, we conceive them. We develop, we construct, and we actually own the product from A to Z. And that's for me the, the most important part in the very traditional way when 100 years ago, you know, a watchmaker would be working in his workshop and you would have the world traveling to him to get the, the, the products. Nowadays, you have brands that don't produce anything, just create marketing and can sell all over the world. Well, that's great, but that's not what we, what I believe in. I believe in creating products and owning the product. And that's very important to us. And that obviously has a cost to us. Uh, it would be sometimes much cheaper to uh, to, to do it externally. Uh, and we took the, the decision uh, in order to, to master our art to continue to do it uh, ourselves. Secondly, the most important, and I think it's the most important thing is independence. Um, you know, if, if you want to be vocal, if you want to be provocative, you need to make sure that Actually, you, you don't depend on other people, and uh, and we took that that risk. Uh, there was a decision with uh, with our family to say, okay, we want to uh, 
to uh, to be fully independent. Reason why we produce our hairspray, we produce all the elements in the in the movement, and we su even supply uh, around 25 uh, other brands, including a lot of the small independent brands. I, I you, you mentioned, uh, I think Max was uh, was live with with you uh, a couple of weeks ago, and you know I like to to talk to him on a regular basis and exchange ideas, and also the fact that we co we collaborate, and I think he's very open about it. Uh, about the de developing the hairspring and his beautiful watches, uh, I respect enormously what what he's been doing because he's, they are a source of inspiration. They were there before uh, before us, uh, meaning my my team and myself. So having all those independents working together, uh, collaborating together, um, is is something extremely important. And yes, sometimes it has a cost, but I think the people who value um, as I said, the human factor, the, the details in the products, uh, they, they look at it and, and they really value this independence uh, as, a, as, as something special in the product. Even if it's, you know, you compare two movements, you look at a hairspring, a hairspring is, is, is so small. How do you compare something that you buy from, from the big groups that is a standard and something that has been customized and developed uh, using Strauman material that sometimes take years and, and decades to, to develop? For the normal customer, he has no clue, and frankly, he doesn't give a, he doesn't care. Uh, but the people who understand Moser, they will see the difference or feel the difference. Absolutely. When we've been uh, in your premises, I remember obviously the holy grail of the uh, hair springs and uh, handling the wire itself and uh, seeing following the whole process to that brings you to uh, come out with your hair spring and. Uh, and it gives us the possibility to. Time, and it gives us the possibility to to do special things that you cannot do uh, elsewhere. And I see a message here. You know, we can and we did in special, very special editions. Sometimes do a special hairspring, something that we don't even tell the customers. We create a, a purple hairspring uh, or uh, or a blue hairspring, which is kind of the the customers who have bought that special edition would have discovered uh, only once they have bought the, the watch. And that's what we like. Sometimes have those small elements that. You won't see at first sight, but maybe three months later, if not all your friends if, <laughs> have told you before, you will discover those uh, small details. And I think that's what makes um, uh, luxury products special. You shouldn't see everything at first sight. There should be like kind of two levels of, of, of reading, a little bit like in our communication. Yeah, there is a great point in that because it, I think it's fair to say that when you can master your own production from A to Z, then you can propose the kind of flexibility, you know, in terms of producing unique bespoke pieces that, you know, in other situations when you're talking about industrial productions or when you are outsourcing, you can't do unless you are, of course, committing on big, big quantities and big productions, um, I guess. True. Sure. Um, yeah, so from the in-house, uh, as I said, the holy grail of watchmaking to the the, the bad part of uh, watchmaking. I'm obviously being sarcastic, but if we talk about marketing, uh, starting from the starting from the um, the point that even not doing any marketing is per se a marketing strategy. Uh, you've had an interesting approach because after um, getting very solid and very strong with the in-house manufacturing and the fact that Moser came across as one of the only fully integrated manufacturers, you adopted uh, a slightly provocative uh, or very provocative for the standards of our, our industry uh, marketing approach. So um, regardless of, of course, what you, your strategy is, what do you think what is the importance that has to be given to marketing these days in uh, in the phase of change that we are living these days in the, in our industry? Well, I think there's there's, there's two options. Either you you um, you rely on word of mouth, you adapt your your strategy to be able to survive with somewhere between fifty and hundred watches a year, and then you know marketing is is. I would say I wouldn't say unnecessary, but is is not the most important thing uh, you do. Fortunately, if you want to be bigger than that, then you need to be selling in retail stores uh, where you're competing with huge brands who have huge budgets who want to take your space in those stores uh, all the time. Because obviously, you want to take the space from the smallest in the assortment of those multi-brand stores. So we need visibility. And like it or not, and you know, as I said, what what we do and what we love is the product. But we need to do uh, to get visibility, to build brand awareness, and also communicate our values. And, um, and yes, at Moser, we have we have decided to uh, to 
to bring a strategy uh, that is a little bit different because there's no way you can survive is if you do something the same way as the others if you don't have the budget if you have big budgets you can say whatever bullshit you want people will end up believing in it uh, because you repeat you repeat multiple channels you know holistic approach well we cannot afford that so we need we need um, we need to communicate uh, with our values, with our, our hearts, uh, about the things that we believe in. Ob hopefully, every time with an important message that uh, that is important to us, and um, and that's what we've been doing in the last few years. But at the end of the day, we continue to create beautiful products. We we like to to express more and more, you know, all the innovation, the craftsmanship, all the details that we have in the products. The the fact is, today, if I make a movie about the double hairspring. Um, it will talk to a certain group of people um, who will love it, will understand it, and and those people is our is our core uh, friends or partners. Uh, but unfortunately, it doesn't help us expand beyond that. And if we want to survive, we need those other people. And reason why we have developed this um, this strategy of having topics that go beyond. The, the pure craftsmanship, but we try. We're not. We're not forgetting the rest. We're working on on expressing the the amazing story and the amazing history of Moser. The brand is 190 years old. Who really knows about it? There's tons of things we could talk about. But if I make a movie about the history of Moser today, and I make it, you know, I don't know, 15 minutes long, who's going to watch it from A to Z? Nobody. So we need to find different ways. And we're working, for example, on on, on ideas now to create something that will express what is the history of Moser. But that's something that is d dynamic, funny, sometimes provocative, uh, in, in in line with what we've done so far. I think what we have achieved to do in the in the last uh, five years was to create a language for Mozart, something that is different, that is unique, and that helped us a lot. Uh, and now that this language uh, has been, I would say, established, that a certain crowd seem to appreciate it, then we can we can start working on topics that are much more related to the products, the craftsmanship, and the history of each motor and company. And that's something you will see in the next few months. Sure. Um, I want to say, where are you in that process? Uh, how much of Mosa you think still needs to be uh, explained? And how much uh, is out there you think fairly um, clear in the eyes of collectors? Now that you have taken the liberty of taking away the Swiss made, taking away the, your brand name from uh, from the dials, so is that a signal that you're thinking that you are halfway through? Uh, you 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 know you you started to get there. Uh, I think there's there's so much. It's so it's so deep. Those are, those who have come and visited our museum, the family, the Moser Family Museum, who have you know, seen what what Moser has done in uh, in Schaffhausen. What uh, the, he has done in in Central Asia, in Russia, etc. There's tons of things to talk about that even the, the biggest collectors and even myself uh, haven't uh, are not aware of. So uh, I think we really have the bugging. There's tons of things to talk about on the technical side. No, a lot of innovations that we're trying to bring to market. Takes that, you know, uh, an, an innovation uh, like the perpetual calendar take years. And and we don't want to make the mistakes of the past of bringing markets uh, products to the market too too early. I think we have brought amazing uh, new products in the um, in in the last few years, but in a way also leveraging a lot of the amazing things that my predecessors have done. It's much easier to come in my position and take over things and say this this is not good. Oh, there they made a mistake. How can we improve? Then starting from scratch. Uh, and, and 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 trying to build something, which is for me the most having had that experience and failed in the past. I think that's extremely difficult. So I'm very for fortunate to have support of my family, the independence, and coming after amazing people, great engineers who've developed amazing movements that we kind of re-engineered, that we optimized, that really uh, brought quality to it. And now it's time to um, also bring slowly uh, amazing new innovations in the market and explain them again and again. You know, sure. The double hairspring, who knows about the double hairspring except the core of uh, our uh, followers or, or Moser lovers. Um, there's so much to say about it, uh, but first we had to fix the quality, understand what we wanted to do with Moser, and then we can start talking about those amazing elements. Absolutely, absolutely. I was going to, um, to go more on the Edouard Melin side than the Moser side, but I have one last, uh, one last uh, question. Uh, more in regards of the brand and your strategy with the brand. 
We are living interesting times, uh, um, and uh, I really enjoyed. Uh, <laughs> I really enjoyed. Uh, I got this. <laughs> I, I, I still have, you know, working on this. <laughs> I still. Um, so starting from Geneva, the day before Geneva, you launched or nearly launched uh, the, the the amazing project with the Swiss icons that didn't quite uh, go according to plans. Uh, but it was, uh, for those that uh, don't remember, I think there are very few, um, there was a big, uh, uh, how can I say, uh, reflection that you wanted to provoke on the very concept of Swiss made. And what Swiss made means these days, um, we all know, or most people will know that to be called Swiss made, basically a brand has to justify 60% of production assembling costs within Switzerland to make it, you know, very, very easy. Uh, and uh, Moser has taken a certain position in regards to, to the loose, uh, the loose rules related to Swiss made. Without going into the details, why is Swiss made important and why is, why have you turned into a strenuous, uh, defender of the pure concept of Swiss made? Uh, again, it goes back to what I said in the beginning. I think it's all about uh, tradition and and what you believe in. We are today at H. Moser, we produce most of the parts uh, ourselves in-house and the rest is, is built, built in Switzerland. And, you know, we see a lot of, in the last few years since I, I, I started, you know, running a, a brand, I, I met a lot of journalists, a lot of, of customers, a lot of retailers asking, oh, you know, why is the, uh, is the Moser that price where you could have a small second, maybe for a thousand Swiss francs or, you know, uh, what do you think of connected watches, et cetera, and, uh, et cetera. And my, my reflection was to say, you know, how can we really express what we stand for, what we believe in? And how, that's how we started back in 2016, um, um, speaking to, to the press and, and, and the world or whoever wants to listen to us about what's important to us. We started with connected watches. Don't forget that connected watches and smart watches, in a way, have, have, a, have a connection to Swiss Made. This whole campaign is all connected to, to one idea. What is the future of, of Swiss Made? Where do we come from? What do we believe in? Uh, you know, I have the chance to have a, a father and, and people in, uh, before that in, in our family who were in, the, in watchmaking. And my father was uh, in watchmaking during the, the Quartz crisis. Um, and, and, you know, telling me that, the, you know, the reason why the Swiss traditional watchmaking uh, survived was because there were some amazing men who decided to stick to our values of traditional watchmaking, preserving old movements, when some brands who probably disappeared today decided to go the other way around. Yeah. So for me, it's it's important to, to kind of remi re remind cer certain people, or uh, at least ourselves, what is important um, uh, about Swiss watchmaking, about Swiss made, what does it mean? Maybe, and I believe we need more transparency, uh, because if we don't, uh, pay attention and we are not careful who knows what's going to happen in you know 10 20 but most likely 50 100 years remember that swiss people um, became masters of of uh, of watchmaking because they were first uh, uh, copying uh, actually the big masters who came from uh, from uh, great great britain or france who knows where the next uh, <laughs> quality label will come from uh, hopefully, we'll stay in Switzerland for for many years or a hundred years. But if we're not careful, we we might slowly uh, drift away from the true uh, values of uh, Swiss watchmaking. You make a great point because um, never like these days, and I think it's the first time that uh, something like the, the limited edition, for example, is is fully justified. Just setting up a business only based. Uh, on the love for independent watchmaking. I think independent watchmaking has never been as thriving as in these years, these last years that we've been uh, we've been living, and I I would I want to say the last ten years probably. Um, in that respect, you you mentioned Max uh, before, uh, of course, uh, Win Mosa. You've been one of the ambassadors of that, but I I, I may you know add uh, you know Stepan Sarpaneva or the success that uh, you know Kari Wutilainen yeah, has. Yeah. Uh, all work and uh, yeah, you name it really. So it's for us, it's really exciting, exciting times. Is that now on the Edouard Melan side, when you approach the market as a watch lover, is there a brand that you feel like gutted or not 
uh, a bit sad that has not managed to quite make it yet. Uh, do you have a deer in the market of independent watchmaking that, that, making that you really like and it's not got there or it's getting there or, you know, whatever you would like to add? The Melon, the Melon brand eventually. No, that's, not, that's my father's dream. No, no, uh, I mean, there's tons of amazing brands in all categories. I'm, um, well, I'm a big, big fan. I think among independent brands, I love what uh, what uh, Max is doing. I like Ressence. I think it's a it's a great brand. Um, of, obvious, obviously, you know the Carrie Boutilainen, the, the Philippe Dufour, the uh, what uh, Rech, Ar Ar Archivia, uh, Recep, Recep, um, those guys are doing. I think it's is, is amazing and contributes uh, to. I can tell you traditional watchmaking. So yeah, yeah, I can tell need... you, you talk to Max very often because when I, well, we I ask the need... same question, yeah, absolutely. We need, we need, we have to as independent brands. We need to try to find ways to collaborate. You know, we we have the chance to have a distribution company in uh, in uh, in Hong Kong with my brother, where we distribute Moser, we distribute uh, Outlands, we distribute the Betune, which is also an amazing brand. I think that really brings something different and unique to our industry with with great value of uh, of tradition. But also very modern and and and, and bringing something different. Um, I, I I value that, and I think it's important that we we try to find ways to collaborate. We see an if I see an opportunity, then I will try to, uh, for another brand. Then obviously I will try to recommend the brands which I believe in, and 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 vice versa. And I think that's why we collaborate very well with brands like uh, like Max Brusser, etc. But beyond that, I think I'm, I what I love is uh, I, I I'm really inspired by German brands. I, I think you you might see it a little bit in our products, um, the very Bauhaus. Um, should I say a minimalistic uh, approach of uh, of the big brands, you know, coming from Langen Zöner all the way to Nomos or Jung Hans. I, I, I love, for example, the uh, the Max Beal collection from from Jung Hans. And as I started with Moser, that's at that time that was the only watch I ever bought in my life was uh, was a chronoscope from from Max Beal. And arriving at Moser, I. I I, I think I fell in love with Moser also probably because I like those kind of designs and, and that contributed to going into this very minimalistic approach on certain of our products. So as you can see, I'm, I, you know, <laughs> if you take uh, Max on one side, Urberg and, and uh, Nomos and Jungans, it's kind of diverse, but I love to take the, the independent uh, kind of rev revolutionary uh, approach of, of the, the Max and Uberg and, and try to combine it with the very minimalistic German engineering of uh, Lange and, and, and Nobos, sure. etc. And maybe that's what makes Moser uh, what it is today. Sure, sure. And there's, um, there's an amazing contribution these days from uh, the foreign uh, high-end watchmakers as well. Like uh, in our case, we'd experienced a great uh, success in the last two years with uh, Konstantin Chaikin, for example, but I can mention also um, uh, Garrick. Garrick uh, uh, watches uh, um, designed by Andreas Treller in terms of the movement, but then the production carried out for the first time in a long time besides Roger Smith in the UK. And uh, I could mention Sarpaneva. So how, how do you see this... Um, uh, watchmakers based abroad uh, as more of a source of inspiration, as a good thing for the market, as an extra uh, enticement for collectors? What's your, what's your point of view? I, I think it's, it's important to have the diversity in, a, in, a, in an offering. Uh, I think there's not enough, actually. If we look at, uh, at the big brands, um, uh, you know, there's the idea of going back to classics, uh, tradition, etc. I think it's important to have diversity, and I think uh, cultural uh, elements help or contribute to, to building this diversity. And I, I'm very pleased to see more and more uh, independent brands coming from Russia, from Germany, from the UK, um, from Japan. I think there's great, also great sources there and, uh, and everywhere else in the world. I hope one day I, uh, we can even collaborate with some of them. Well, that's, yeah, that, I, I, can, I can easily picture that out. It'll be... Yeah. Some of it would be unbelievable. There's, yeah. there's been a lot of discussions, but it's it's not always easy. You know, we have big egos in the watch industry. <laughs> yeah, the one that yeah again, Max seems to be tr uh, tracing the way in that respect. Is uh, of course his his whole model is all based on uh, on uh, on those collaborations. So yeah, yeah well, maybe Just, one day we'll do something with Max. Yeah, yeah. Talking of which, uh, again, 
Um, thank you very much to all of those that are adding comments after comments. We are live on Instagram and Facebook, so it's a bit difficult to um, uh, to follow up with all the comments. But I think Edouard and myself will try to do our best to come back on your on your questions um, because the interview will stay live on our Facebook page, the Limited Edition Watches, and on the Instagram account, uh, Limited and Rare, and I suppose also the H Moser account. Um, so talking of Max Busser from MBNF, we had a good uh, a good chat on um, to be an independent watchmaker in terms of uh, product development, but also in terms of attitude and how you communicate. You are forced to always be out of a certain comfort zone, so you always have, by definition, to try to be original. And and uh, it's it's good enough, you know. You launch the HM1, uh, or, or you know, you, uh, when you started with Moser. Uh, you start with your first, uh, uh, very first important groundbreaking projects, and then you have to repeat yourself a second time, and then you have to go beyond the third time, and then the fourth time again, because people expect more and more and more, because th you have set out a path for people to get used, uh, for you to be very creative. So, what's your trick? How do you stay always out of the of, out of the comfort zone, not to be banal, not to be, um, um, how can I say, uh, predictable? That's the word. It's complicated, uh, as you said. You you need to innovate all the time. I think uh, it's probably even more difficult for for Max because it's really like every product he, la he launches has to be something completely in unexpected. At H Moser, you know, we have defined our identity as you know minimalistic, rethinking all the complications in the in the watch. Uh, industry portfolio of complications with the most attached being you know the the innovation uh, you know smart solution rather than complications um, our fume dials you know I can take a, a the chance that I have today is that I think there's a lot of complications that I can play with uh, just bringing the most design makes makes it already special uh, you know we're working on a chrono for example well of course I, I need to the bar is pretty high considering the level that we have with our perpetual calendar. Uh, but still, the idea is how can we bring that kind of ingenuity and that kind of minimalism in a, in a chronograph? That's two parameters that makes my life a little bit easier when we try to develop a, a, a new product. Yeah. So where, where you're right is we are very dependent on innovation and, um, and creativity. But at the same time, as the brand grows and the awareness grows, the positive aspect is that we rely more on uh, we, the, the, the contribution of uh, historical products, I mean, historical, not 100 years ago, but uh, from the last 10 years, uh, be becomes bigger and bigger and makes uh, our life a little bit uh, easier. But uh, it's, it's, it's a lot of work. And I think I have the chance with H. Moser to have, I would say, product life cycles that are quite long. We still sell today a lot of perpetual calendars, and they are, all, they are more than 10 years old. I don't think there are many independent brands that still sell the same. Uh, of course, the, maybe the quality of the movements has changed. Some of the designs have changed. We launched it in, in new cases as well. But still, you know, it's not a completely new di di uh, development that takes sometimes five years and millions uh, to uh, to bring it to market. So, so yes, yeah. it's extremely important and complicated. But I think, in a way, I'm a little bit lucky uh, with uh, H Moser and company. Yeah. Yeah, and I suppose yeah, the challenge is always uh, to to create a, a uni uh, yeah a, a unified image of the brand and the collection, but at the same time to be able to surprise. So I, of course, you're moving in a in a tiny space sometimes. And I, I um, think of uh, yeah. of our our approach a little bit like uh, the car industry when when you launch. I try every year to think of you know what's going to be our concept car. So it's a concept watch, something I express an idea, something that is a little bit unconventional that is something different that will make people talk about Moser and better understand Moser but at the same time you know we're still launching beautiful small second uh, 39 millimeter with a beautiful fume dial with index and uh, and and logo same thing with the, the new automatic so we try to have like the I would say the standard collection and some crazy conceptual ideas uh, combined I think that's what makes the brand grow year over year absolutely I'll have to just change my uh, audio setup for a second. Can you hear me, Edouard? Yeah. Yeah, okay. I just have a, a small uh, issue with the battery, so I don't want to lose the connection because 
It's so uh, very interesting what we're discussing. Um, the, um, we're we're going, you know, we, we, see, we see in the light at the end of the tunnel, so don't worry, we're nearly there. Uh, but I think you know it's very rare to have insights of this kind. And I want to give a space, a little bit of space also to the uh, to the questions that are raising on uh, on our comments. Uh, there is a uh, Frank Luz that is underlining the, of course, the how can I say the importance of innovation. Um, uh, and uh, but it's kind of wondering, and he's asking you, Edouard, uh, how does a, an independent brand find uh, the balance to get to the right economies of scale to then compete in price with the with the big boys? <laughs> Well, it's impossible to compete in purely in price with the big boys. So I think you need you need to to be um, to develop and take the time to develop movements with the idea of being able to increase the, the size of batches. When I when I started, we we would produce certain models in uh, in quantities of one by one or up to twenty by twenty. Today we try to go more towards 100, 200. Uh, also because the demand has increased, um, but also because we've been rethinking the processes to be a bit more efficient, actually much more efficient. Uh, we also try to, when we develop the products, to, um, as I said, to bring value, innovation, but at the same time, at the end of the day, we need to think when we develop, at what price are we going to be able to sell it? So that's one of the elements that is extremely important to us when we, uh, when we, um, when we do the, the specs of a new development. Uh, and then we go, in, into all the phases of prototyping, pre-series one, pre-series two, until we are ready to go into the market. Because uh, if you try too early, then the, 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 one of the big parameters in our, uh, our cost is the time to assemble the, the movements. And, uh, and if you take too much time to assemble, then obviously the pro you, you're going to kill your margin or your price is going to be too high. So what we've been doing is really take the time to bring them the products to the market, uh, have a thorough analysis in the beginning in how much time are we going to be able to, to assemble it, how much is it going to cost us, and then we can bring it to market. A good example is the perpetual calendar. When I started five years ago, it would take 90, 90 hours to assemble one movement. 90 hours, um, that's a lot, a lot of money. A big cost because a watchmaker is is... Some, you know, somebody that uh, has a good salary that has studied many, many years and, uh, and saving on that time is the most important element. Today, we can produce the same perpetual calendar uh, in 30, 30, between 25 and 35 hours. So it's a huge difference. The quality is much better. Um, and <laughs> that's helped us contribute uh, with margin on some products that we were selling basically at uh, with a loss five years ago. So again, you you, you need to innovate, but don't be, I'm an engineer, and I, I know how difficult it is to go away from your dream product, which is you know has all the features, all the characteristics you, you want, and something that actually, actually at the end of the day you can you can sell and people will will appreciate. Uh, and that's where you need to sometimes, and it's difficult, uh, step on certain of your dreams so that it. It keeps something uh, you you you're in line with the commercial uh, aspects. Uh, otherwise, you will kill the company. Absolutely, very interesting. Um, still, on the more more of a personal uh, uh, point of view, we have talked about brands that you like, uh, you appreciate, and you respect. Is there anything that really gets you tired in the watch industry in terms of words that are used by all the brands to describe themselves, and uh, they're all using the same words? Is that one that you could single out just to give you to give us an anecdote uh, about yeah i think uh <laughs> just look at the, our marketing campaigns i think there's a lot of works words that get get us a little bit annoyed um i know we, we're being sometimes sarcastic that's maybe in our uh, or in my nature um uh, provocative at the end of the day it's really the, the it's all about this marketing bullshit i'm i'm I would say annoyed, but seeing, or maybe I see too much of the insights of this industry that when I see certain things on, on advertising or the way people express, talk about certain products, that, that just get me a little bit sad. And um, and we, you know, Dish Moser believe in the products and that's what we want to highlight. And maybe maybe it's about frustration as well, you know, saying that uh, if you have a lot of money, you can, uh, you can express a lot of things, even though you, you might not be uh, doing everything that we're trying to do, but that nobody sees. 
yeah. so yeah i don't know i don't have a special word um, but yeah, yeah there's a little bit of sometimes of frustration try trying try it's it's our own way to express it uh, like it or not yeah it's there is one that always gets me in the last 20 years that i've been in the watchmaking and it's uh, it's different because it's one one word that is used by every brand on the planet so i always wonder if everyone is different then basically everyone is the same at, at one point so uh this is where my uh question uh came from initially um but you know we all the other side of course so you're living the, the, day, the dream talk, uh you know um, talking about the same oh, thing you know it's always about uh okay. swiss manufacturer since who is the the eldest um it's all about uh uh it's always about the same same words and uh, yes i agree i mean it's, it's it's becoming sometimes tiring yeah um sorry we had a little bit of this connection and somebody also earlier telling me that the audio wasn't great but yeah. again be patient because facebook instagram of course they are external platforms and there will always be up and downs depending on connections depending on how many people connect and so on and so forth so uh, yeah, it's not as yeah, we had a little bit of a break make is that xp but we are back in back in back on track now we i have the last two questions so we should we surely be be done very soon um so you are living the um how can i say the magic of being a entrepreneur of you of yourself of your company uh, that you're running um besides watchmaking besides our industry what is the tip or the tips that you would give to somebody that is embracing his uh, life mission and he's trying to make of that life mission his own living and his own uh, project for the future well, i think i'm going to use the same thing that everybody says but based on my experience is is not not to listen to uh, to uh, what most of the other people say i think there's always people that are going to be there to uh, try to destroy, destroy your dreams so i think it's important to believe in in, in what you like uh, i think it's important to uh, to uh, to be realistic uh, it always takes more time it always takes uh, more energy and more money uh, than you anticipated um, but if you ha if you have the right uh, the possibility to kind of reflect on yourself on your ideas and try to get the best people around you who you trust then uh, then whatever is your first idea and that's what people say you invest in people and not in ideas i think whatever what your first idea was uh, eventually you'll find your way and uh, and uh, yes again it's believe listen to your heart Edward, sorry to interrupt you if you agree i will just uh... I will just uh, turn you off for a second and try to reconnect because the the signal is gone and this last question okay. was was very blurry actually okay. if that's okay with you Yeah Peter, Could you help me So we're trying to reconnect with uh, Edouard Melan from uh, Moser Watches we had a lovely lovely conversation for 50 minutes now and uh, no, it's, it's okay. Yeah, we should be okay now. And we're back. We're back now. Edouard, can you hear me? I can hear you. I cannot see you, but that's that's not important, really. <laughs> as long as we can. Uh, uh, yeah, we have the last, um, the very last question, is, I suppose. I think. Um, yeah, Edouard Melin, if you could spend. Oh, okay. Yeah, I can hear you. I can see you now. Okay, we left. Okay, we lost Duarte for a second. Try to get in touch again. We're still live on Facebook. Uh, just have a a little a little um, issue on Instagram. Yeah, we're back on. Can you see me? Can you hear me? No, you can't hear me. No, I can't hear you. Okay. I, I right. see you on Facebook, but okay. So we say bye to the our uh, listeners on Instagram. Thank you very much, and um, we'll carry on on Facebook now with Edouard. Can you hear me, Edouard? Thank you.
Yes. Yeah, okay. Technology. Yeah, it's, you know, when people talk about mechanical and digital technology, I always define digital te technology, the technology that is always supposed to be working, and then something always will happen at one point. So, you know, uh, but we are pioneers in this, um, as I don't think this double, uh, double broadcast Instagram, Facebook has been done before uh, many times. So uh, thank you for, for uh, um, testing with us uh, for the benefit of our collectors, of course. So I have uh, one last question for you. Uh, uh, and it's for you personally. You have to spend three hours uh, with, a, with a character from the past that you, is now obviously available these days. Uh, do you have somebody that you really wish to? Uh, and if yes, uh, why and who? Hmm. You, I guess it doesn't have to be from the watch industry. Obviously, that the no, no, watch industry good. people have, have had a huge impact on uh, on my life uh, and me. I think uh, there's one person I had the, uh, the opportunity to meet um, actually a couple of times uh, just when I started in the watch industry, and that's Gerald Genta. And I think um, he really had an eye for for design, for uh, for products, and I would love to uh, now that I have the experience of being on uh, in charge of a brand and therefore have the have to have the the creative eye. I would love to spend time and have a uh, a good discussion with him. Um, today, you know, people like uh, like um, Mr. Biver, I think he is uh, is a visionary person. I think he's uh, he's extremely dynamic dynamic even uh, today and I must admit sometimes I, I ask myself what what would he, would he have done um, had it been in my position um, you know, in, uh, in whatever prob problem or opportunity I'm facing so uh, these are the kind of people you know product marketing visionary that I would love to um, to have met uh, somebody like I don't I know it's it's an, an answer that probably a lot of people would uh, would use, but somebody like uh, Steve Jobs, you know, this this idea of building a brand, an ecosystem around a product that, you know, even sometimes was already there before he had actually reinvented it. Uh, there were tons of uh, MP3 players before he created the iPod. There were tons of uh, mobile phones before they created the the, the, the iPhone. So. Uh, understanding his way of, of thinking with um, you know, uh, design thinking, customer focused, uh, customer understanding, trying to be a, a head of or creating needs that the, the people don't uh, don't actually have or don't know they have is is for me magical. And I would love to understand uh, to understand that. I try to tell my, my team sometimes um, uh, that we need to be ahead of the of the curves, ahead of our customers. We need to create something that people will uh, will feel surprised or at first sight would say, oh no, that's not for me. But a good example of something that we did, I think pretty well where our, our logo, our um, dials without logo. Uh, at first, even internally, uh, everybody was, you know, salespeople were saying, how do I sell a watch without a logo? And now nowadays, uh, you know, everything that we, we bring to market is going uh, very quickly, uh, it's sold out. Um, but people in the beginning would have never thought, you know, ah, oh, I love a watch like this. I even saw a lot of people coming back after two or three years and say, oh, I would, I would love now the watch with the logo and uh, without the logo. And I, first, when I bought my watch, I, I didn't like it, but it grew on me. I start to understand why you, you did that. And I, I think that's the strength of a, of a brand. We need to be creators. We need to be you know, designers. Uh, take an example of a Karl Lagerfeld. He's not thinking about, uh, oh, what is the color, um, what is the fas fashion color this year? He's creating that uh, that fashion. He's the one who needs to be ahead of everybody and and create something that everybody else will follow. Well, that these are the kind of people that uh, that impress me and that will lear learn to meet, discuss, and hopefully learn from. Brilliant. Right. What to say? Um, massive thank you, Edouard. Well, thanks to you and for the opportunity. This was a great hour of um, honest um, uh, insights on, um, you know, running an independent business, uh, taking risks, being an entrepreneur, and um, projecting all of that to uh, the public that needs to to, uh, to appreciate it. And um, uh, we are in the same boat on that. So uh, of course uh, uh, we will uh, keep you up to date with all the feedbacks that we will have. 
Uh, as I said, for our collectors, the interview will be online for a long time and um, we'll go on our YouTube channel as well where the interview with Max Busser is. And um, I, I thank you again, Edouard, Edouard Melin from uh, Thank Chef you. Thousand. Uh, good luck and uh, yeah, and uh, we'll uh, we'll be in touch uh, because I have plenty of other questions that I would like to ask. But I, I uh, happy to answer. And if anyone wants to contact us, they know where to find us on Instagram, Facebook, or per email. And actually, we we uh, we try to answer all of them. Myself or my brother or Nicholas. Perfect. Thank you very much. And I'll thank uh, you. Take care and see you best. soon. Bye bye. So that was um, that was brilliant with Edouard Melin, second chapter uh, after the one with Max Busser. I have to say I'm uh, personally very humbled uh, with the limited edition to be able to uh, project uh, this kind of um, uh, insightful uh, information that is uh, really what uh, really nurtures our passion for independent watchmaking. Uh, we have a surprise in the pipeline for the next broadcast, so stay tuned with us. We'll uh, reveal it uh, very, very soon. And uh, again, any question, any comment, uh, don't be shy, be in touch. Uh, the limited edition team is here uh, at your disposal to talk about watchmaking anytime. So thanks for the time, thanks for the attention, and I shall see you soon. All the best.